to Post-Grad Processing, the podcast where a recent college graduate talks about the transition from student to worker and all the feelings wrapped up in it. I'm your host, Michaela Graff, and today I'm feeling confident, you guys, which is ironic considering the topic of today's discussion, but I can't help it that I just came out of a really good job interview that kind of boosted my confidence. And this is already coming off of last week's high with me ending the week feeling more confident in my teaching abilities with my ESL practicum. And so obviously I was a little nervous going into this job interview as you always are, kind of. (laughs) I haven't met anyone who doesn't have at least a little bit of nerves going into one. It's just our natural response. But I will say, the job that I was interviewing for, this is the first time I've truly felt like, okay, I definitely check all these boxes. This is something I could do easily. And it's in a field that I'm interested in, and it covers topics that I'm really interested in. So, I was already excited going into it, and then it was just a pre-screening type of interview, so we're setting up one in person, but already, I mean, the whole time, it was just her being like, I just really love everything that I'm seeing, this is really good for this position, this other thing, you've got, like, all these are pretty much bonuses, and then she even ended it. I don't know if you guys can tell that I'm smiling (laughs) through the podcast right now, but I generally am a more positive person and I smile somewhat out of just natural response. You know, it is still genuine and so I could feel that I was smiling a lot during the interview, but she was like, just go into the place that I'm applying for and dazzle them with your smile and all this stuff. And I was like, oh my gosh, stop, thanks. (laughs) So feeling much more confident now, very hopeful and excited for this job opportunity. So I'll definitely keep you guys updated on whenever I get to do my in-person interview. And then if I get a job, of course, you guys will be the first people to hear. All that being said, today's topic is kind of the exact opposite. We are talking about imposter syndrome. Before we get into it though, I do want to make a quick announcement that in case you haven't seen, I have changed the upload schedule to Mondays. So you may have noticed that this did not come out on Saturday or that last week's blog did not come out until Monday. That is the new schedule. It's just going to be I think a lot easier, especially if I get this new job and the type of hours that I would be working. I think it'll be better for everyone if this comes out on Mondays. And so instead of getting to end your week with me and post-grad processing, now you get to start it. So you're welcome. (laughs) Or you're just listening to this whenever you want to, and that's also fine. But In case you're looking in the future for new episodes, they will be coming out every Monday as well as the blog. Now we can finally get into imposter syndrome. So in recent years, you may have heard this term floated around, especially on social media. And I do want to give you a little bit of the actual psychological research behind imposter syndrome as well as kind of the colloquial language and definition that we've kind of learned through the internet. And then I really just want to apply it to my own journey post-graduation and that specific context of it. But if you guys would like, I'd love to do a deeper dive on this in the future, maybe even have on a guest because I have become increasingly interested in this, especially since I graduated and I have not gotten the chance to read some of the original publications 
and studies and I would love to continue looking into that and if you guys are interested I'll be happy to share what I find here. So for today we're just going over the basics and then how I have seen this phenomenon at play in my own life and then later on down the line we may continue this discussion if people are interested. For now, this first bit of information is mostly coming from the decisionlab.com and their article on imposter syndrome. And I wanted to go ahead and start with the history, give you guys a brief overview of where the term comes from. And it was first described back in 1978 by Dr. Pauline Clance and Dr. Suzanne Imes, who were both clinical psychologists. And they published their findings in a book titled The Imposter Phenomenon in High Achieving Women, colon, Dynamics and Therapeutic Intervention. And long before this was published, Dr. Clance had actually struggled with the same feelings that they would describe in this book, but she didn't realize how many other people felt the same way. She felt like she could have been almost unique in this. However, that was not the case. As I mentioned, both of these women were clinical psychologists and they worked with mostly women and particularly really successful women. So a lot of their clients were undergraduates, medical students, even PhD faculty at several universities across the United States. And Among these clientele, more than 150 women described having these feelings that they were not qualified to be in the positions that they were in, that they had somehow cheated the system, or that they didn't really belong there, and that at some point people would realize that they had fooled them, in a sense. From this point on, until the 90s, There were a few studies conducted, but for the next 10 years between 91 and 2001, interest in this imposter syndrome seemed to increase quickly, and there were over 215 studies that were published within that 10 years. And recently, I personally feel like it has been brought to the attention more. At least it was brought to my attention more. I didn't really hear much talk about it, even in my psychology classes in college, until I would say the past year, two years, especially in the context of different generations in the workplace and different approaches to that. But actually, there was another really significant piece of literature that came out back in 2011 by Dr. Valerie Young in her book, The Secret Thoughts of Successful Women, colon, Why Capable People Suffer from the Imposter Syndrome and How to Thrive in Spite of It. And here she kind of took what we've learned from Clance and Imes and broke it down into different types of people who experience this or different ways that imposter syndrome sort of manifests and this is where I'm going to come back to that later but I do want to switch gears and quote a study that I found coming from the National Center of Biotechnology Information or the NCBI and this actually originates from statpearls.org com and It comes from authors Martin R. Huker, Jacob Schreffler, Patrick T. McKinney, and David Davis. So, as you can see, this is actually coming from a male perspective, which is not one that we have seen so far. But in this article, they have what I think is a pretty good, succinct definition of imposter syndrome. And I'm going to go ahead and just read the first two sentences out loud for you guys. Quote, imposter syndrome is a behavioral health phenomenon described as self-doubt of intellect, skills, or accomplishments among high-achieving individuals. These individuals cannot internalize their success and subsequently experience pervasive feelings of self-doubt 
anxiety, depression, and or apprehension of being exposed as a fraud in their work, despite verifiable and objective evidence of their successfulness, end quote. So basically what I've been getting at is people who suffer from imposter syndrome feel like an imposter in their workplace or in their academic environment. As I've seen pointed out, it especially is common among people in the medical field and more specifically among women and other marginalized groups. This is not to say that it does not affect men or other groups of people, but in much of the research, it points to a more frequent experience among women. And so the reason why I'm bringing this up now is not just for that definition, but in this article, the authors actually describe the imposter cycle, which goes hand in hand with what I had mentioned as Dr. Young's five types of people within imposter syndrome. And so I'm kind of just going to go bouncing back and forth between these because they pull off of the same ideas. And the first one is perfectionism, who we know and love but actually hate here at Postgrad Processing. I just mentioned it again last week and I know I called it a sort of disease and I really think it just has this ability to choke all the good things out like a weed and make you doubt yourself and your own abilities even when you have, like this article says, you know, verifiable an objective evidence of the fact that you are successful or that you are qualified in these areas. And so the way that someone with imposter syndrome would struggle with perfectionism is they typically self-impose these honestly unattainable and unrealistic goals or standards for themselves. So these are not things that other people are telling them, like, you need to achieve these things. They are putting that on themselves. And then these actively contribute to feelings that they need to be on top. There's normally a level of hyper-competitiveness. And so you set these goals, these standards that are really not realistic, and then you hold yourselves to them And in your striving to be at the top, top of your game, top of your workplace, whatever, you are not really able to fulfill these goals in the way that you want to. And then it just creates this loop that you can't get out of. And this normally leads to an intense amount of pressure on yourself, as well as like an avoidance of new tasks because you're afraid of failing, which is exactly what I was just talking about last week. What was sort of plaguing me when starting my practicum is just having these expectancies for myself to be an amazing teacher right off the bat. And feeling or really knowing that I'm not going to be able to do that, that there's going to be room for me to fail, it was scary. It was hard to overcome. And so you'll see as we continue on that a lot of these things kind of play into each other, hence why it's called the imposter cycle. And these different types of sufferers, I feel like, are not necessarily different people. It's just different ways that it can manifest in you at different times. At least that's what I would see it as. And so the next part of the cycle is known as superheroism. And it's exactly what it sounds like. It's tying back to that need that we see as the perfectionist to be the best to be at the top and this superhero mentality often leads people to push themselves 
harder than they need to and beyond their own limitations to fulfill a myriad of different things, to be a superhero, to be that person who has everything all together, who can take on everything, and even often feels like they should be able to take on more. Again, to a level of, like, superhumanism. To a level that no person should really have to or can really be able to do. And then if they're taking on too many things and they fail at something, whether that's real failure to their standards, who knows, but if they fail at a role because they've obviously taken on too much, it leads them to shame again from that perfectionistic standpoint. They feel like, oh, I should be able to do all these things, no problem. And then when they obviously can't do all those things, then again, it's like, oh, There must be something wrong with me. I must not be qualified to be where I am right now because I can't do all these things that, again, no one is saying that they have to do other than themselves. And a lot of the times they'll over-prepare for things. And this is really so that they look like they're capable of doing things, look like they're ready to do things, even if they're not, or even if they have too many things to be keeping track of. And I think a lot of us might associate this superheroism also with burnout because obviously taking on additional workload after additional workload is not normally the greatest for your mental health. And again, you aren't meant to take on all these things and yet you feel like you are supposed to or like you're failing if you don't. And so it's just, again, a part of this vicious cycle of imposter syndrome. Moving on to the third aspect, we've got that fear of failure that I already mentioned. Again, these all just kind of go into each other. Its psychological name is attichophobia. And again, whether the sufferer is up against their own tasks for success or ones that are actually placed upon them, like externally, there is this anxiety that comes along with it, which really rooting back to the fundamental feelings of being a fraud, being a fake, a cheat, if they fail they feel like they're going to be exposed for who they really are or who they really think they are, which does not necessarily line up with everyone else's idea of them as a successful person. And this is actually where the two sources that I'm reading off of kind of vary, where the difference in the imposter cycle versus the five types of people who suffer from imposter syndrome, because... The third type that Dr. Young references is the natural genius. And this is more described as someone who, again, going along with the superhero, they believe that anything that gets thrown at them, they can easily overcome. They can easily handle. Anytime that this person is struggling or has any sort of difficulty in completing these tasks in a way that wouldn't classify them as a quote-unquote natural genius, they consider themselves, again, to have failed and to be fraudulent. Very similarly, the fourth type is the expert, which is someone who expects and wants to know everything all the time, have all of that, and anytime they fail to present answers to a situation, again, they're feeling like a cheat. They're feeling like they have exposed themselves as someone who does not belong in the successful environment that they're in. And again, this comes from your own pressures. Like, no one has all the answers. No one is omnipotent. And feeling like you need to know all these things is unrealistic. And yet, Here, many, many people are with 
almost a fear of not knowing something. And this does bring us back to the fourth part in the imposter cycle, which is a denial of your own capabilities or knowledge. And so this kind of goes hand in hand is like you expect to know these things, but really you feel like you don't know anything is what I would describe this as because again really coming from those same perfectionistic tendencies and behaviors people who experience imposter syndrome are likely to downplay their own achievements or skill levels experiences any of that qualifications and this is not from like necessarily a state of humility this is literally like to themselves they do not see themselves as capable or competent in certain areas especially anything related to success and because of this they tend to internalize any failure and like really take it to heart so I'm sounding like a broken record but it's all at play with each other There's this fear of failure because they have put all these unrealistic expectations on themselves and then when they're met with any type of failure, it in their mind brings down their level of competence or capability and they feel ashamed and unworthy of success, which... Our final part of the cycle, known as achievemophobia, which I feel like you might be able to guess a little bit of what that is, and that's the fear of success. So not only when you struggle from imposter syndrome do you feel unsuccessful, so you might notice like it almost feels contradictory. Like there's so many things at play that feel like they shouldn't be able to go together but when you see them described like this you can see how they're all at play because you've put these really unrealistic expectations for success on yourself and you expect to be able to juggle them like a superhero and you don't want to fail at them like you're very scared of failing and when you do fail you see that as yourself being incompetent or incapable. And because of all this, you're also afraid to succeed. So how can you be afraid to fail and succeed at the same time? Well, it's because of those same root feelings of not belonging and not being ca- and not really truly being capable and sort of fooling everyone because if you are successful, then naturally there will be more external expectations put on you higher standards for achievement or extra workload and when you feel like you don't measure up already if you're successful in any way there's going to be that fear that things are only going to get harder for you and in no time you're going to be exposed for the imposter that you are and to wrap up the other side of things the five different types we have the soloist and that's someone who like the superhero feels like They should be able to work on their own. They should be able to do everything by themselves. They don't want to ask for help. They don't expect to need help from anyone. And they think that if they do, at any point in time, need help from someone, they're considering that a failure. So you can see how all of these things can manifest differently and yet very similarly in someone with imposter syndrome and... I would guess, I don't know for sure, so this is not on record coming from either of these things, but someone going through the imposter cycle would likely also cycle through different types. I'm not 100% sure. I'm, there could be the possibility for someone to only be one type of person, but if you are experiencing all those different facets of imposter syndrome, it's very likely that you will see yourself as any number of these. And in any case, I can at least say for myself that I related to 
pretty much everything here. And in one way, it is comforting to see, like, the study, the research behind all this and know that it's not exactly uncommon, especially among women like myself. And I can't exactly pinpoint the time in my life in which I would say that I started feeling very similar symptoms, but definitely things like perfectionism, fear of failure. I mean, I see those coming from even secondary education, even my high school years, probably even before that. And then especially so in college and even now, like I've been talking about really successful people or just in highly successful, high achieving environments like university or the medical fields and stuff like that, which I can no longer relate to. But that's where I find it interesting as someone in this particular season of life, because where I most see this at play right now is even just in the job search. And I've talked to friends about this and they feel very similarly. It'll be like what I mentioned weeks ago, where you're looking at these applications and you're seeing these qualifications and you're feeling like, I don't, I don't measure up. And this is not (laughs) in the way that you might literally not measure up, but like a friend I was talking to recently who was also having to apply for jobs was telling me the things that the job posts were asking for. And I was like, you literally meet all these expectations and more. And still she had those feelings of self-doubt, like, I don't know. I don't think I'm good enough for this position. I don't think that I really deserve to be there. And while I encouraged her and was like, no, you definitely qualify. I felt like I was in the same boat. Even in my previous jobs, I felt the same way. There have been times where I'm like, I'm really not supposed to be here. I don't have the qualifications that everyone else does. And again, there's no way that I really truly should be working here doing what I'm doing. And even having those feelings of being a fraud, being an imposter, like I don't know how I got this job, but I shouldn't be here. And any day now, someone is going to realize that I shouldn't be here and I'm going to have to leave or I'm going to have to stop doing what I'm doing. Or in the more positive things, I'm going to have to change. So there could be a positive spin, I guess, on these feelings. It's all about how you choose to address them in your own life. But inherently, I would not say it's a really great thing to have going on. I mean, like I said, the language of these is talking about people who suffer from imposter syndrome. And to that, I also want to add, like, I have not seen a psychologist who told me all these things are imposter syndrome, you are suffering from it. But in the colloquial sense, I would definitely say that, yeah, I relate to imposter syndrome. And I typically don't like to throw around undiagnosed things lightly, especially as a former psychology student, anyone claiming they have OCD or ADHD or things like that when they really don't, you know, bothers me just because people don't understand the implications of that language. But with imposter syndrome, it's kind of different because... There is no actual diagnosis. Like, this is not its own separate mental illness or anything that you can be diagnosed with, as far as I'm aware. It's not its own section in the DSM-5 or anything like that. And, I mean, clearly anyone who suffers from imposter syndrome probably suffers from some sort of anxiety disorder. I, those would definitely go hand in hand, especially because there's a lot of fear of different things associated with these. But again, there's no clinical diagnosis for imposter syndrome. So I feel a little more comfortable saying that. 
And I find it very helpful to have something to refer to, to see the specific symptoms, the specific areas in which these feelings are manifesting and the behaviors that are associated with them so that I can combat them, so that I can work against them and recognize them in my own life. And so I've already started trying to work against my perfectionism. This is a long-standing battle and I'm sure it will it still not fix itself overnight, but being able to see these other things like where does this perfectionism stem from and where does it infect? What other parts of my life does it infect? When I'm feeling like I'm not capable of something, is it because of the impossible standards that I've put on myself or am I really not capable? And if I'm not capable, isn't that okay? Do I feel like I need to be capable of everything? If so, that's a problem. Maybe I need to address that. So you can see how researching this has got me thinking about my own life and about my own mindsets and how I can change those and how I can recognize them in everything that I'm doing right now. I would love to hear from some other people's perspectives because like I said, I've already heard from friends who also see this imposter phenomenon at play in their own lives. And if anyone else has any feedback, please don't hesitate to reach out to send me something because I'd love to continue discussing it. And like I said, (laughs) I wasn't going to be as research heavy today and then I was, but this is just the surface. Like I said, this is just even me seeing the basics and describing the basics, but I would love to get into like that original book about imposter syndrome and get to see some more research on how it has been studied in different fields. The paper that I pulled from Stat Pearls, it focused still mostly on the healthcare profession and medical students, but I would love to see if there's any research, again, in this transitional season or in entry-level positions or even, like I said, maybe generationally because there's been a lot of discussion over the past couple of years in the generational difference when it comes to just workplace approach. You know, it wasn't too long ago that everyone was up in arms about quite quitting and what that really was and if it was bad and we got to see how different generations described workplace competency, responsibility, success. And I think that's very interesting. And I'm sure that different generations and different groups of people experience imposter syndrome in different ways. So if anyone is interested or has any resources that they've also looked into and you want to send them my way, please do that. As always, all comments, all discussion can be sent from the contact box on the blog site, which is postgradprocessing.wixsite.com forward slash blog. And as always, that is in the description for today's episode. And... You can also find links to social media or links to other platforms on which you can find the podcast. And of course, this week's blog post, which is a somewhat more concise version of today. So honestly, truly, if you've listened to this, you probably don't need to read that. But, you know, wouldn't hurt for you to just click on it. Give me a little website traffic, you know. Again, I want to remind you that Things have changed and everything will be coming out on Mondays from now on. So I will see you again next week. For now, this has been Postgrad Processing. I'm your host, Michaela Graff, and I'll see you again next week with more stories and a lot more feelings. Stay cool.